three pr principles in the 12 week year it is defined in the American Heritage Dictionary for the edition as the state of being bound emotionally or intellectually to a course of action or to another person persons. A commitment to con a conscious de decision to take specific action to create a desired result. Commitments are powerful in a way. Commitment is accountability projected into the future. You decide beforehand that you will do whatever it takes to reach that goal. And the more accountable you are, the more likely you will meet your commitments. <clears throat> the state of being bound emotionally or intellectually to some course of action. There's the definition. <clears throat> we all have examples in our lives of the power of commitment. A time when we locked onto a goal or objective and were willing to do whatever it took to reach that. Think back on a time like that in your life. What did it take to make that happen? What level of commitment, action, follow through, <clears throat> persistence did it require? What were you feeling as you followed through and kept your commitment? How did it feel? <clears throat> what did it feel like to reach your goal? How did it make you feel about your ability to reach your goals? How did it enhance your confidence? How did the vision of your ultimate goal affect your decisions and actions, even when you were faced with adversity or were tempted to give up? I always love that analogy we've mentioned before in these sessions about it's like climbing a mountain or hiking a mountain mountain right even though as you're hiking up there might be things in the way might be you know cactuses I don't know rattlesnakes scorpions landslides rocks you name it right that doesn't mean you give up it means you might take a little pause and evaluate what's another way that you can continue forward because you are going to reach the top of that mountain right Maybe you're going to go take a different path. Maybe you're going to decide to go around. Maybe you're going to decide to go through the mountain or, you know, whatever. <clears throat> There's lots of different things. Maybe it just means you need a little break and maybe you need some support and you need a friend to link arms with and move forward. So I like that analogy because I think it applies to a lot of different things, whether it's health or life or work or business. Um, we, you know, we keep moving forward, but sometimes we, we shift a little bit in the way that we decide to move forward and that's okay. <clears throat> I want to look at commitments on two levels. The first level describes what we prefer to, what we refer to as personal commitments, those we make with ourselves. The second is about the commitments we make to others, our word. Let's start with personal commitments. Personal commitment is a promise you make with yourself to take specific actions. It may be working out consistently, spending time with the family, stopping smoking, or making a certain number of sales calls each day. Take a few minutes right now and think about two personal commitments that you have made and kept with yourself. Identify two personal commitments and that you succeeded in keeping. So that's, we'll take a second. You can think about it or write it down if you want to. Two personal commitments that you succeeded in keeping. <laughs> Give you a minute. And then those of you on live, you can share in the chat if you want to. <clears throat> That's always nice to and encourage and celebrate. <clears throat>
Can you repeat the question? I lost you for a second. Identify, identify two personal commitments that you were able to follow through with and succeeded in keeping that commitment. What was it? Uh, does graduating <laughs> college count? That's something. Yeah, I would say that's a commitment. Yeah. Um, could be like. And holding a regular job. <clears throat> if that's one of your commitments. Yeah. Holding a job. Um, it could be, you know, there's smaller things like, I don't know, doing the laundry weekly or, you know, something like that too. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be really big things, but. Okay. <clears throat> if you guys want to put them in the chat, great. We'll um, touch on those later to celebrate a little bit. And remember, the more that you celebrate the things that you have been able to do, the more your brain wants to do more of that. So that's one of the reasons that that's a really great question. And it's helpful to share so we can celebrate those things, even if it's, hey, I walked five minutes a day for a week like I wanted to, or I... I don't know, cut out sugar for a month or whatever it is going to be. There's lots of different things. Okay, now think about what the results were for you. When you kept these commitments, how did you feel about yourself? What Was it easier to make and keep other self-promises later as a result of keeping these? How did you feel about your ability to do what it took to get the results no matter what? <clears throat> Capture your thoughts below. So if you're, you know, if you're following with the book, you can do that, um, but you can do it in your own notes or in your planner or wherever you like to keep notes. Benefits of keeping those commitments. What came out of that? You know, confidence. Did you build new skills? Did you learn something about yourself? Um, were you able to achieve something in particular or, you know, feel better, whatever it is. <clears throat> Take a second and think about that. In chapter nine, we discussed how powerful commitments are. And there are three times when all of us struggle to follow through on these commitments we make. New Year's resolutions are often great examples of this type of struggle. In fact, most New Year's resolutions are abandoned long before the goal is even close to being realized. Let's take a look at why that is. To frame your thinking, we will use an iceberg metaphor. As you probably are aware, a small portion of an iceberg, approximately 10%, is above the waterline, and the bulk of the icebergs is submerged below the waterline. What I'm suggesting is that human beings are much like icebergs in that at any moment, there are only a small fraction of our thoughts, emotions, and physical sensations that we are actually aware of and above the waterline. Using the iceberg metaphor, where do you think intentions fall above or below the waterline? And I have the picture here, so I'll show you guys. You know, let me grab the, the larger version of it you have. I mean, didn't like every teacher in high school have that that iceberg poster in their classroom at some point? Or it was like, Probably something like that. You know? Yeah. Is it this um, one? May, yeah, I think so. Except it was like a cooler picture than that. <laughs> Similar, but yeah. <clears throat> so. So can you repeat the question one more time? Where do you think your, let's see, let me read it again. Um, where do you think intentions fall above the waterline or below? They probably fall like below. Well, well no, wait, uh, that's kind of a weirdly boarded question. I think intentions are usually conscious. 
but let's see what they yeah, say. Okay. Um, you will realize that intentions fall both above and below. So what they're saying is there's the conscious ones we're aware of, and then sometimes there's unconscious ones. So we'll read a little bit more about that. Okay, so what this means is that we have intentions that we are both aware of, our stated intentions and those which we are not really aware of, hidden intentions. Often the stated intentions which I am aware of are in conflict with the intentions that I am aware of. Let's look at the example of conflicting intentions. A common New Year's resolution is to lose weight. During our workshop, we often ask the question, who here is overweight by your own standards? Typically, at least half of the hands go up. Consider the question yourself. Are you overweight by your own standards? If your answer is yes, when you have conflicting intentions, at the 10% level, our intention is to reach our ideal weight, but at the 90% level, based on results, you have different intentions. When you ask participants to list some of the hidden intentions, we've gotten the following. For example, yeah, I want to lose weight, but I like to eat and I don't want to give up on food I enjoy. Yeah, I want to lose weight, but I don't want to get out of my warm bed and run in the morning. Yeah, I want to lose weight, but I don't want to expend the effort. <laughs> yeah, I want to lose weight, but I don't see myself at that weight because I've always been heavy. Um, yeah, I want to lose weight, but there's not enough time or, you know, not enough energy, fill in the blank, right? So you see how that goes, it, that that can happen in a lot of different areas of life, not just with this example. Technically, these reasons are the manifestation of something deeper. It could be a limiting belief, or it could be the desire for comfort, pleasure, pleasure, satisfaction, relaxation, or maybe entitlement. The point is that often hidden intentions exist below the waterline that we aren't fully aware of and can conflict with our stated intentions or our goals. So for example, I want to call, follow up with, or send a message to X so many clients every day or every week. However, my unstated or unconscious um, intentions might be like, well, I'm tired. I want to sleep or I want to do these, <laughs> these are these other things that, you know, watch TV or, you know, look at Pinterest or, you know, like there is sometimes other things that come up that we don't realize they're there because of course our natural human desire is for comfort, pleasure, satisfaction, relaxation right? And that's very normal. So once we realize we have those hidden things that are kind of going on that are just sort of a habit, if you will, or an unconscious um, thought, habit, so on and so forth, we can begin to counteract those a little bit and intentionally push ourselves past those when we know this is time that I have designated to do this, I'm going to follow through on my commitment. I'm going to do it even though my subconscious, oh, you know, intention wants to just relax and watch TV or whatever, right? Um, so successful commitment occurs when your stated intentions begin to align with your hidden intentions. When you begin to shift that with habit, um, and commitment. Uh, so when your stated intentions are stronger than your hidden intentions, or when you consciously reconcile the conflict between the two is when you progress forward and you follow through a lot more on your commitments. Let's look at a business example. For many sales professionals, generating consistent referrals can be the difference between success and failure. But even sales reps with a stated intention to ask for a certain number of referrals every week often don't even ask. Clearly, something is getting in the way. What might be some of the sales reps' hidden intentions regarding asking for referrals? I want to ask for referrals, but I haven't earned it yet. I want to ask for referrals, but I don't want to risk the current sale um, leaving or canceling. I want to ask for referrals, but I have a fear of rejection. I want to ask for referrals, but I don't want to appear needy. I want to ask for referrals, but I want to be liked. It might make the situation uncomfortable. 
The probability of a sales rep with a set of hidden intentions like these asking for a referral is near zero. So it's almost zero likelihood of them actually doing it because of those things. To be effective, the representative would need to first know these intentions exist and reconcile them with the desire to gain referrals. In chapter nine, we gave you four keys to success, successful commitments. Here's a reminder. Strong desire, your keystone actions, that means your highest priority action steps that you know produce results for health, you know, eating healthy, doing certain activities, drinking your water, eliminating junk, right, for your health. If it's, you know, keystone actions for a business, it would be talking to X so many clients a day or potential clients a day and following up with, you know, people, those kinds of things. Those would be keystone actions that produce results and income and so on and so forth. Count the cost. What does it cost me to not follow through on my commitment? Is it going to cost me time, money, my health, my sleep, whatever, right? So know what it's going to cost you to not follow through on the commitment. And then act on commitments, not how you feel. You know, for example, I know I need to do blah, 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 but I'm tired, right? So that's acting on your feeling as I'm tired. If you are following the strategies that we've been talking about, you will have scheduled in your time for your week. That's you're going to be your rest time, your health time, your family time your self-care time and your work time or your time for these action steps for your strategies, right? That should be woven into your routine. And that's why we have these meetings. That's why we have these discussions. If you haven't done that, then reach out for support. That's what, another reason we're here is that we can support and encourage each other in that process. We're developing a habit and a rhythm within our life that allows us to have time to rest, time to time to do all of these things and time to work on our commitments. So that is why, um, that's why we're talking about this. And um, if you need support with it, there's no shame in asking. So there's a little commitment exercise I'm gonna run through for a couple minutes and then we're going to um, pause and we'll go through any questions and discuss anything that you guys need. Yeah, and sometimes we have to work through, I like that comment that you shared there in the chat, we do have to work through some of these blockages and overcome. Okay, here's something you need to know. Did you know fear, fear of anything, fear of failure, fear of rejection, fear of, fill in the blank. Fear is the same level of um, mental, physical, biological energy that excitement is. It's just shifting it a little bit with the mental piece. So that's why you can, you have the ability to shift that. It takes practice sometimes. There's not like a magic button or easy button, but you can shift from, I'm afraid of rejection to, I'm excited to try, right? Or, you know, fill in the blank. What was the other ones? Um, I'm, a, I'm afraid to fail. Um, I'm excited to give it my best effort. The worst that can happen is you learn from some sort of a mistake or challenge. That's the worst that can happen is that you learn something, right? So start shifting those thoughts that you have or feel, feelings, thoughts, however you want to phrase it. Start shifting that to, I'm excited to X, Y, Z. That will make a huge difference. Okay. All right. So let me go through this um, exercise really quick and then we'll finish up. Okay. So in this exercise, you will have to work through the process of establishing your set 12 week commitments. So you want to write this down if you can. Um, first, determine a few goals that would represent a real breakthrough for you in one of your priority categories, your spiritual growth, your spouse, your family, your physical health, your personal well-being, or your business. Pick a couple of those. I recommend to pick two. For most people with a busy life, two is enough. You can do more if you want to, if you feel like you have more time and energy available. It's up to you. Okay. Next, identify the keystone actions 
that will have the biggest impact on reaching your goal. It's important to know that we are not saying that this is necessarily the only action that will need to be taken, but these are important ones to prioritize in your daily work time or time you're working on your commitments. Ideally, this action is something that you can engage in daily or weekly. Write one of the actions for each of the goals. So you'll have goals underneath that. You're going to put what are the keystone actions, the high priority actions that produce results. It might be one, two, or three, maybe of them per goal. Sticking with my example of getting in shape, there's a lot of things I can do to lose weight and get fit. The two basic categories are diet and exercise, but within those, I have dozens of choices regarding my nutrition and habits. I'm going to need to choose the ones that I feel like work for me the best. I need to choose the ones that will have the most positive impact. Personally, if I work out four or more times per week, my eating habits automatically improve, so my keystone actions for getting fit is working out. This is an important step because to be successful, you will need to not only commit to your goal, but more importantly, commit to your keystone actions that you're going to be doing either weekly or daily. Now, determine the costs that you will have to pay to consistently take that action every week or every day. Write those in the box. You can put that in your notes, or if you have the worksheet that I sent out, you can use that. Write those in the box under commitment costs. This is where you surface any hidden intentions that may conflict. So you're determining the costs that you will have to pay to consistently take these actions. Is it going to take time? Is it going to take energy? Is it going to take sacrificing some TV time? Is it going to take what? What is that going to be? So you are directly starting to address what some of those blockages might be. Sometimes the cost is going to be pushing through some fears, pushing through and deciding to be excited instead of fearful. Um, this is where you will surface any hidden intentions that may conflict with your stated goal. For example, the cost of working out every day might include giving up some TV and cutting back on my golf, uh, socializing a little bit less, spending less time with my family, maybe getting up a little earlier and exercising regardless of how tired I feel. The cost of dieting might include giving up some of my favorite foods, reducing the number of times that I eat out or me eating smaller portions. But in order to feel better, it's worth it, right? Finally, circle the keystone actions for which you are willing to pay the cost. What is, what's it worth to you, basically? They are now your commitments for the next 12-week year. These are the actions that you will enter into your 12-week plan each week. Whether that's weekly, daily, some people do, or, you know, are doing them three times a week, whatever. Okay, that is for today. We'll go into more next week on commitments um, to others and what that kind of looks like. I'm going to pause this so we can discuss a little bit. <laughs>